Okay. All right, so um, let's uh, discuss the project a little bit to start with here. Okay, I had a lot of good discussions in office hours today. Okay, and uh, just to help you out on maybe writing a report and so on. Okay, so let me, uh, in terms of, there's some, we've told you how we're going to grade the project, but let me give you an actual fact what's going to happen. Okay, what can differentiate one result, one project from another project? The most important thing is the spe meeting the specifications. Okay, that is the number one thing. So specs so for the report or for your project. Specs, meeting all the specs is the number one thing. In fact, if until you meet all the specs, we don't really look at your figure of merit. Okay, so that's, that's another aspect of it. The second most important thing, okay, is the report itself. So let's talk a little about what the report is all, all about. The goal. What's what's the goal that I have for you guys in this project? Okay, the goal is that you understand the circuit that you turn in that meets all the specs. Okay, how it works. That's really what I want you to learn. What, what's really what's going on there? That's that's the most important thing to me. Okay, so in other words, someone asked today was what happens if I have two circuits? Circuit A. Boy, it really does a great figure of merit and uh, meets the specs. But I don't understand how it works. Boy, it just somehow really works great. Okay, circuit two doesn't do such a great figure of merit. They're not really bad, but not and meets all the specs. But I really I really understand how it works and write up a nice report on it. Exactly. Here's what was going on here, and here's how it works. Which is the one I want? I want the one that you understand. <laughs> okay. If you can't explain to me how the circuit works and what's going on there and interesting things about it. Something you can find out some interesting, or something about how you came to that circuit. You know, a little narrative on that. That is the most important thing. Okay. So goal is understanding how the circuit works. Now, how do you get that across to me in the report? Okay. What you don't need to do is to rederive stuff that I've derived in class. I mean, you know, the answers for differential pairs and common sources and all that sort of stuff. Don't need to rederive those things. You know. I know those equations, okay? Right. So the what I would like you to do is any deviation from what is, you know, the standard stuff that I showed in class, or you know, something that turned to be something particularly sensitive, or just if you can show me things that indicate that you understand what's going on in your circuit above and beyond just the rote classroom results that I presented. Okay? Does that make sense? You get a question of that? I can. So, uh, I, I, so in other words, it doesn't have to be very long. Okay, I'd say a page or two is just fine, or you know, I'd be you know, uh, and of just describing what's going on and hand calculations and so on. Right, a nice mix of hand calculations and you know, describing what's going on through the circuit, you know, stage by stage, would probably be a nice way to organize it. But certainly, I'm open to other ways. Okay. So the third is figure of merit. Now, so how do we deal with figure of merit? Typically, what happens in a figure of merit, I'll plot it. There may be a couple of people that really nail it. They get a really interesting new idea. Then there's kind of everybody, most most people. Okay. Then there will be a few people who didn't try very hard. <laughs> okay. So and these numbers are by a factor of ten. Okay. This is by you know times a tenth, times ten times. That's that's the kind of granularity that I sort of care about, right? So if you really miss the mean of the class by a factor of ten or a hundred, then I kind of count down a, f a little bit. Not even that I won't give you zero or unless you're a thousand times, right? Okay. <laughs> so and if you're improve a little bit above the class by you know some significant factor, then you may get a f you know a little few more points as well. So pretty much what the important thing is that you can hurt yourself if you don't try and figure of merit. But if you, and you can help yourself a little bit, but it's more you hurt yourself than you help yourself, right? By not doing a good job there, I guess. They look at it. Okay. And the fourth thing is, okay, with originality, uh, just other aspects of the design. If there's something really clever about what you did for some reason or other. And being clever for clever's sake, like I say, just making it complicated and doing something weird, 
you have to have a good reason why you did something. It's got to be something that contributes to something better. What came up in um, discussion today was robustness. How will we deal with robustness? And we've been a little inconsistent on that. So I'll tell you what right now. Don't worry about this robustness issue, okay? Um, what robustness is all about is making sure your design is works over common mode input range. That's robust against common mode input range. You're having to design for that. We gave you a spec on that. Having to have sufficient gain over output range swing. That's being robust against output range voltages. You have a spec for that. What we do not have a spec for is being robust against W over L variation or, w or VT variation or any of those kind of things. So don't worry about that. I mean, uh, I think the TAs have been giving you some insights into what is a good circuit and what's a bad circuit in terms of being robust. In fact, one has come up several times now, so let me just say it. You know, doing the bias string purely with transistors, you know, is, uh, you know, generally not a great idea. And the reason it's not a great idea is because what you're doing is VDD is being set equal to N, let's say there's N of these transistors, N times VT plus N times VD sat of these transistors. Where the problem comes in is VT generally has a variation. So this is also plus or minus N times delta VT. So this circuit would has fairly poor robustness against VT variation. Okay. Well, we didn't give you anything about VT variation in these transistors, right? So I think it's I won't require you to have circuits that are robust against that. Okay. I mean, so this circuit has an advantage. If, if you do this, you don't waste a lot of area on resistors. Okay. And so that's kind of a benefit of it, but it has this problem, right? I think the TA has been telling you what, what are good circuits, what are bad circuits. Store that in your heads because future versions are going to have some variations of the process, okay? And you're going to have to be more, more uh, sensitive to what things that don't work so well. Okay, is that so? The reports don't need to be that long. We have 80 of them to grade. So uh, what it's important to us is to get to you know, the issues, okay, right? Explain to us in, in a nicely defined, clearly organized approach uh, that you understand what's going on. If I see lots and lots of material and it's hard for me to figure out what's going on, my assumption is that you're trying to make it difficult for me to read because you didn't do something right, okay? <laughs> so make it easy for me to understand what you did, okay? Um, hand calculations. Hand calculations. Okay. So, what do you need to do for hand calculations? A member, some brought up today, you need to look at the SPICE model to see what you should use for your hand calculations. Remember that L, as given in the SPICE transistor, is minus LD, the, the lateral diffusion. So the real L that you get when you have a W over L of a transistor is W over L minus LD, right? So don't forget that when you do your hand calculations. Do the hand calculations for, I'd say, uh, the range. You should do it for getting a rough idea where the, v, where the DC voltages are. But when you, when you um, here's a good idea. If you could do this, it would be nice. If you did a little hand calculations to find out where the DC voltages are, and then run SPICE and you find the DC voltages, we ask for you to um, annotate your SPICE net list with the actual DC voltages. Why don't you put the two numbers there, your hand calculation and your um, SPICE generated value of the voltages, so you can just sort of see the two voltages right next to each other. I mean. What's important there is, it doesn't matter they have to be exactly the same, just be able to explain why they're different. Or just sort of say, this is because of, we're beginning to get into subthreshold. There's probably a good reason why a lot of things are not going to be exactly what the SPICE answer is going to be. 
Otherwise, do it for all the specifications. You know, figure of merit should be hand calculated. Um, the common mode gain should be hand calculated. The common mode gain as a function of the input common mode voltage probably will be the same value for all the different in input common mode voltages, right? Because you'll just everything the transistor is staying in the same region of operation, so it probably won't change there significantly. So there'll be a few hand calculations you have to meet. It probably won't be equal. A lot of the numbers will be the same, right? The output voltage gain will be the same unless your output stage actually changes um, state somehow or other. Back to robustness again, I want to just say something else. It could be true that um, certainly for your nominal condition when you have the output at 0.6 volts and your input at 0 or 0.6, whatever it is, um, that for that, I can't imagine I might be wrong, uh, that all your transistors won't be in saturation. They probably should all be in saturation, okay? Just because you're kind of, if you have a resistive transistor in linear, it's kind of acting more like a resistor than a transistor, so it's probably not doing anything very useful. Though that may not be quite true. If it's not true, it might be interesting to explain that, right? But at the extremes of the regions of operation, particularly on the output, it might be worthwhile to have a transistor go into linear region, okay? And I showed you that on that last lecture, right? I mean, let's say, let me try again here. Let's say it looks like this. So here's the breakpoints for saturation. Let's take this as zero volts, and let's say this is your 0.3 volts you need to have. And let's say 0.3 volts is right here. Well, this voltage right here, if you have a, let's say this voltage is set for by VT plus a VD sat. Mm, I'm sure I'm going to explain this right, by the way. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a little bit higher than. So in order to get this down, you may end up making VD sat really big, right? I mean, it may have to make this, I mean, the W over L really large to get this VD sat to be small enough, okay, if you want to stay in saturation. But let's say we allow ourselves to go into linear region on the output. Well, what happens is the gain drops on the output stage, but if you can compensate that for that in your first stage, that's probably okay, all right? So you may want to get to the low voltage by letting the output go into, satur go into linear region operation. Yeah, I'm not sure this. Maybe this is just VD sat. So yeah, so this is this is VD sat. So you know, if you keep trying to make it, it's no VT here. Forget that. So you may have to make VD sat to make it get it small enough with the amount of current flowing. You may have to make WL really large. I'm saying, but if you allow yourself to go in linear region, you can actually get less voltage drop across that transistor. You'll be in linear region operation. But that's okay. All you're suffering is some loss of gain in your output stage, which could be compensated as elsewhere, which may have a better figure of merit. Okay. Makes sense? Any questions about that? Yes. Try it. Is it is it work? Is it work? Okay. This is um yeah, what is this? This is V out versus V I D. Yes, right. Yes, you're right. Okay. This is this is kind of D C this is the big V I D. Yeah, right. Big V out. Right. Our small signal gain is, you know, quite different. Okay. This is for the last stage. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So that's okay. So let me go back to my list of things here. Um, meet all the specs. Number one thing. Okay. Um, figure merit, time calculation, subthreshold. Okay. Subthreshold. I kind of been sort of a little maybe cavalier in talking about subthreshold. Let me just say a little bit more about that. If your VD sat starts to get, this is as calculated by assuming saturation. You know, that's our 2 IDS over K prime W over L to the 1 half number, okay? If this number gets on the order of, you know, 20 millivolts, you're probably in subthreshold, okay? If you're sort of 20 to 100, then you're 
sort of in a combination of subthreshold and which is called weak inversion, same name, and strong inversion, which is where our formula where our equations really hold, okay? Subthreshold is strong inversion. Really tough region to analyze. And but I'll tell you what you do there. If you're in that regime, if you go right to the transistor and get the transistor parameters directly and use those in your small signal calculations for your hand calculations, that's okay. And you don't have to use incorrect values of GM and stuff, which are assuming the wrong region of operation. Go right to the transistor itself and get the small signal values. Okay. We'll, we'll hand out, we'll make available to you what, I'll tell you what it, one of the, my students did a while ago, Ian O'Donnell, he made a little program, he calls it TCAR, Transistor Characterization. What it does, you put in the current, you put in the VDS, you put in or your, your combination of currents and DC voltages, and it gives you out the small signal parameters by running SPICE on one transistor. So that's one way to do it. I mean, just you can get the parameters for each, for the bias conditions that you actually are operating at, and use those for your small signal uh, analysis. And greater than 100 millivolts, you're probably in strong inversion, which is where your formulas hold. Okay, so this is one we really know well. The subthreshold thing, it's all the small signal param small signal models the same, just the relationship to the DC parameters are different. Okay, but let me review that for a second. The IDS in subthreshold, this is a subthreshold. Gave this to you for is equal to I S some saturation current. And I S is proportional to W over L. So if you change the size of W over L, you change the si linearly change the size of I S. Times E to the VGS minus V T over N times V thermal. Okay. And this N's a kind of a complicated factor, but you know, it's something like between one and two or something like that. This shows this exponential dependence. So if you want to calculate, and this is times 1 plus lambda VDS. Okay, so the output current is, the output resistance is sort of the same. Okay, pretty much the same. But as you get a comp more complicated model, so you can assume that's the same. So the R0 is the same. The thing that's different, of course, is GM of this thing, which is DIDS, DVGS works out to be equal to IDS over N times V thermal. Okay, by taking a derivative of this, you get that, right? So GM becomes proportional to the current, whereas in strong inversion, as we know, it's proportional to IDS to the one half. Right? So some of you saw that effect. Beyond that, it's pretty much you know, the same as I mean, then once you get this, you go to the same small signal model that we've been using all along. Okay. That's all my notes. Any other questions about the project? I'm happy to answer questions about it. So we'll have a new homework set on Wednesday. It'll be due the following Wednesday. Then there'll be no homework set. A week off, just relax, kick back, you know, enjoy yourselves, and study for the midterm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which is coming in two weeks after that. And it'll be not here, I'll say this again, but it's going to be over in Bechtel Auditorium. So we'll go to Bechtel Auditorium for the midterm. Okay, okay. any other questions with that? Okay, so what I'm going to do now today is some uh, topics I kind of skipped over to make sure you had all the material that you needed for your project last week. And um, this will become more useful at probably in the following projects We'll ask for more robustness. And one area we'll ask for robustness against is supply voltage. So the supply VDD, in other words, okay? So typically, if you're designing a piece of hardware, let's say you're designing a, you know, a amplifier for, you know, your surround sound system, okay? The su there's a supply inside that thing, and the question is, how accurately do people maintain that supply voltage? Okay, if you ask them to maintain it to 0.1% accuracy, it's going to cost a lot. 
So typically what we as the designers do, you have to make a little trade-off between how accurately you ask the system designer to control something like supply voltage and how much we make our life easier for us in our own circuit design. So it turns out we can make our circuits fairly robust if we take a little bit of care against supply variation. So we can allow ourselves to have 10% supply variation. That's pretty typically what people allow. Okay. But if you have a plus or minus 10% supply variation, how do you, you know, you're, remember how our circuits have worked so far for like calculating our, our IREF, all right? If we have a 10, plus or minus 10% supply variation, we probably get about a plus or minus 10% IREF variation as well, which could cause lots of trouble, make it lots more difficult for you to do your design, okay? So the question is, is there a way that we can get a good, accurate reference current which is independent of the supply. And there's several ways we can do it, actually. There's one way thing we can do, which I'm not going to talk about this. We may do it in a homework set. But you actually can set up a, a voltage on your chip that's fairly independent of supply. So you can establish a reference voltage. This is very often used in A to D converters. What's an A to D converter do? It takes an input voltage that you want to convert to digital word, OK? goes through a bunch of circuits, some of the op amps and stuff that we're designing right now. But it, what it does, it basically does a comparison against a reference voltage. So you have your input value, there's this reference voltage on the chip, and you compare those two things together. Well, where do you get a reference voltage? If you're going to have the supply vary by 10%, you can't get it from the supply. You've got to get it from something native in the transistors themselves. And there are things, OK? And so maybe we'll do that in a little project later on for you. Basically, it's VBE turns out to be the best thing, a bipolar VBE, the base emitter voltage, because there's such a strong dependence on current there that you can use that as a reference. Okay, so there's VBE references, we call them. That's references. What about supply current? So what I'm going to talk now is about getting a reference current that we can use. Okay, All right. So this was the old problem. Here's this most straightforward, simple current source. It's kind of it has a almost if you, you a sensitivity you can calculate is the, like the variation in I ref okay with respect to the supply voltage okay and so this is kind of like the delta I ref okay over delta I D delta V D D and really what we're probably not so interested in is the absolute delta change in current we're actually us usually interested in the fractional change in current, OK? So the way we get that is by doing something like 1 over I ref times the derivative of this thing. So this is the parts per million, or typically units are, parts per million sensitivity per volt change of VDD, OK? So that's kind of a parameter you may want to have a specification for. So you can sort of see for this case here, this sensitivity is very large, right? I mean, it's almost linearly dependent on this, this. This right here is unity, right? This factor here is a one, right? For this case, not very good. Okay. What do we do about it? Here is a solution. So it's pretty tricky. There's a major trick going on here. We use it over and over again for all of these supply-independent sources. Okay. And it's shown in this picture right here. So what's going on here? If you look in the top half of this circuit, it looks kind of normal. You sort of you see a current source transistor with diode connected, tied or you know, a diode connected transistor tied over to a current source transistor. Okay. So this current here, which I'll call I left, okay is equal to I right, okay, which is the current established here. Then we can take that same current and use it elsewhere. So this is kind of the output current here. So this is the output, okay. But now, before we put down a resistor and resistor down here and we tied it to the supply or tied to the ground here in this case, and we'd have a not very robust current source. So we put something else down there. We put this down here. And there's a bunch of other versions of this. Well, I'm going to show you three or four different things that will stick down in the bottom down here to make this independent of the supply. Okay. This is kind of one of the easier ones. 
And effectively, what this circuit down here looks like, if you plot the I left versus I right um, curve for it, okay, so let's do that. I left versus I right versus I left, okay. Let's plot that and see what it is, okay. So let's drive it from I left. And let's start with a very low value of current. If there's very low current on this side, okay, that means there's no, the voltage right here is going to be a VT plus a VD sat, right? That's a VT plus a VD sat above ground. But if there's very low current through here, this transistor is cut off, there's no voltage here. No voltage here means there's no voltage across this resistor, so that means there's no current here. So we start off at 0 equals 0. Okay. As we start increasing I left, let's add a current source, and I increase the value of this, that begins to turn this transistor on. Okay. That begins to drop across this voltage, this transistor right here. And for a while, this, and as what's going to happen is that that voltage drop across here will cause current flow through M2, right? And I'll start to turn this transistor on. And so what will happen is, for a while, these things are all, initially, this is going to be in linear region operation, while this voltage is quite low. So we start off sort of increasing slowly. Then finally, after this, all these transistors go into saturation. I have enough current flowing through here that this VT plus VD sat dropped across this resistor has enough current that I finally end up turning this transistor on good and hard. If we assume this voltage is up high enough, this what's going to happen is this will flatten out. So once this guy goes into saturation, we get a VT plus VD set. That's the important thing. The voltage on this node is set by something else, and it's and we have to watch how much voltage swing we can have here. But assume this is high. Say it's tied to VDD right now or something. So this transistor going into saturation is really important to us. Okay. And once that happens, we get, this, we get this condition right here. So in other words, and what is this, this thing? Because what's going to happen is we'll just get a VT plus VD sat drop here. The current will not increase very much. It'll increase slightly. Okay. But here's the trick. What we do is we make the W over L of this transistor very big. Okay. If the W L of this transistor is very big, then this increasing here, this is sort of VT well, it's VT over R, right, plus V delta VD sat over R. If this WL is really big, VD sat's quite small, this term sort of goes away. So the voltage across this transistor is just VT, pretty much. I mean, we've got the condition we have to worry about is VD sat, we want a set of 1, is much, much less than VT. That's what we want to do. So that way we can get rid of this term here. And the voltage across this resistor is now set by VT, independent of the supply. So we now have a current here, I, R, I right, which is pretty much independent of the current. Yeah? Do you, do you usually do the R off chip? R. No, do it on chip. No, this, this is all on chip. Yeah, it, it, this uh, this isn't a very big R. It's not like before, right? Okay, because now we're working with a smaller VT. This, I'm going to show you some. I did last time actually. I already showed you that. Uh, but VT now is just 0.3 volts. It's not the whole supply. But I was thinking because it's not ratioed, if you had a variation in the R. Still got problems. Yeah, you, you're right. No, R is a a absolute value of that R. It's going to have 10% variation as well. So we got here's another dependence. We're not and and I just talked a lot about how VT varies, okay, as well, right? So we've got that going on there as well. But at least we're independent of supply, okay? <laughs> I didn't say we're independent of everything else, okay? So I think, but we're independent of supply for this case, right? So, okay. So now, so this is a way to look at what's going on here. Here's how to analyze this. This upper part of this curve, it's I left equals I right. That's the good old current source connection. The bottom part of this curve looks like this. So let's plot those on the same graph. 
So here's the I left equals I right curve, and it goes through zero. Ignore this other one for a second. Okay. Here's the second curve that I had. Okay. So what's the operating point for this thing? It's right here. It's where those two curves connect. Okay. So you got two nonlinear curves here. And that connection will be at the point, and this curve right here we said is pretty much is VT over R. So this gives us a, a bias supply independent source, which is a function of the threshold voltage of the transistor. We'll come up with other ones for functions of other things, but this is for the threshold voltage. Nice thing about this one, it's really easy to, excuse me, easy to do. I mean, it's just all you do is put this transistor here, make a WRL dig, and you sort of got a supply independent source. Okay. We'll show you some other ones that use bipolar transistors and stuff like that that make it a little more complicated. Now, there's one major problem with these circuits, and this is deadly. It's not so deadly from the SPICE standpoint, because often you won't see it in SPICE, but you'll see it when you get your chip back. You put, they spent the $300,000, actually it's 100, I'll take you give it to them right now. From TSMC, if you want to go out and do your own, if I could take your projects in this course this semester and lay them out, you can go to TSMC, which is in Taiwan. It's a foundry that does chips, okay? For 0.13 micron, which is the process you're using right now, if you have a spare $130,000, all right, <laughs> they will do a run for you and you can get back, I don't know, a few hundred chips. Any takers? Any <laughs> so that's what it costs you these days. Okay, so let's say your first job, you're on the, you went out there, you didn't pay for it, your boss paid for it. You sent the run out, $130,000, you got the chips back, all excited. You're going to go in and measure them. You look at it, turn on the, put the supply on, look at the output, and it's at zero. <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why. Here's why it's at zero. <laughs> There's two operating points here. There's an operating point down here, and there's an operating point up here. If you don't take care, SPICE, or your circuit actually, SPICE doesn't do this, your circuit will find this operating point and be very happy running at zero current. <laughs> okay? Right. So your supply independent source will do you in. Okay. What's the answer to that? The answer to that is you've got to get rid of this zero, zero, this zero, zero act, this point that works, okay? What you really, all you need to do, it's pretty straightforward. There's a bunch of ways to do it. I'll give you the really simplest way, but it's not a very good one, okay? But it, what you can do is just tie a resistor across this transistor up here, okay? So what's that going to do? When I do my I right versus I left curve, I'm going to have an offset in it. Okay? I left will not be exactly equal to I right. Okay? I'll have, when this is down at zero volts, okay, before this guy turns on, okay, I have all that, I got that supply sitting across this resistor, what do I call it? Um, you know, it's a startup startup, okay, resistor, okay. Uh, so it's VDD over resistor startup, okay. There'll be an offset current flowing. So I'll have a little bit of I left flowing all the time because of this offset resistor here, okay. Then what that does, that means these two things, the zero, zero of this doesn't have a corresponding zero, zero for this upper half of the circuit. It offsets things, but it also gives you a little bit of offset up here, which is, you know, maybe okay if you have not much dependence there, right? So that works. Problem with that is you've got sort of a little extra current flowing all the time here, okay? What you can also do in, you know, the books, Rosavi, I'm sure both of them do, you can make a little digital circuit here of some sort that, um, you know, like an inverter that's sensitive to this voltage. And if this voltage is low, let's see how it works. Maybe two inverters. <laughs> you can put a little digital logic here. So, so normally this will be low, and so this will be high, right? And so if that's high, uh, what do I want to do? I actually want to, let's do it this way. Let's just try something like this. 
dream one up right here. I mean, you could, there's a million ways to do this thing, right? So if I have, here's my, so this is M1, okay. So let's take two inverters off here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It's my secret circuit. I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> Patenting it. Right, so, right. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So you have. Okay. Let's see if this works. All right. So when this voltage is low, this voltage will be low. Okay. And that means I'll get an extra current flowing through here. But how does it get over there? Mm. <laughs> that doesn't seem so good. Let's try another one here. You can put it there. Let's see if this works. Uh, that doesn't do it either. Okay. I'm sure there's a circuit, but you get the idea. <laughs> but basically, you can use some digital logic. When this foliage rises up, that, that gate turns off, and then you don't have any current flow. So instead of having it all the time, you can have it only partial of the time, right? Or you can have it connect to a transistor, which turns on. Or There's a whole bunch of combinations there in the book. OK, so that's just the startup strategy. So the, figure out a, a way to do the startup. The, make sure you have this, get this thing off the zero point, and um, you're home free. OK, so this is one of these circuits. Let's look at some more. Here's one that's not VT varies like we said before. Let's let's use actually like I mentioned VBE is actually a fairly well defined voltage. Remember if you <clears throat> when you plot um, a transistor, okay, a bipolar transistor, this is I D versus VBE, right? Because that exponential dependence, you know, typically what we do is this thing just takes off pretty sharply, right? And we have this we generally call this VBE on. Is the voltage right? And it's that's pretty much where this begins to happen. Where this exponential thing sort of takes off, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volts, depending on the size of the transistor. Okay, so if we use a diode connected transistor right here, okay, we basically can get this curve, this ID versus VBE curve. That I'm talking, I just drew right down here. Okay, so let's do the same thing. So here's this upper. Now here's that current source connection, okay, like I showed you before. Okay. Here's this bottom thing. Okay, so we have I right <laughs> versus I left, just like before. Left. As we force current through this, now let, let's what's what's happening on this one? The we have a VBE VEB actually because we got M P M P here VEB plus a VGS one. We go up a VGS one. We go down a VGS two. But let's make these two transistors the same. Okay. So this is basically just a way of isolating this transistor from this node over here. Okay. And then we have voltage across here. So if this these two transistors are the same, that means this voltage right here is also equal to VEB. It's the same as this voltage we had right here. Okay? If that's true, then what we can say is the current through here is going to be VEB over R. Right? Just like before. So go up a VEB, we up a VGS, down a VGS, which is the same, and then you have to drop across the resistor. So this current through here. So we end up with a plot like this again. It's no current to start with. Then it goes up and flattens out. And it flattens out at VEB over R. I says 0.5 volts over R or something like that. V thermal, what is VEB? You know, ID is equal to IS times E to the VEB over VT thermal, right? And so if you take natural, so we end up with VEB for this case is natural log of oops, V thermal 
times the natural log of I out over IS, or ID over IS, right? Which is this current this thing right here, divided by R. So we get the same curve right here. This connection on top gives us the other half of this circuit. We have to put in a startup circuit to take care of that problem, but you add that the same to any of these circuits. And we end up, though, with a VEB over R. So now we're a function of VEB, not a function of E threshold. So we got rid of that variation. And VEB is much more, it's, it's much more set by the physics of the transistor, less so than the physics. Even for a parasitic VEHG. Yeah, it's really, I mean, you look in the, the st goes inside a VEB, it's kind of work function differences and doping levels and stuff like that. So it's really much more constant. And the doping level dependence is quite weak. Okay. Okay. That was easy, right? Okay. <laughs> Any questions about that? Okay. So the little bit of extra stuff I did here. <clears throat> Remember I talked, a few seconds ago, I talked about um, the dependence on, <coughs> excuse me, on um, supply voltage. This, this is kind of, these are sensitivity factors, okay? Sensi sensitivity, <laughs> tough word. Okay, and these sensitivity factors are this, I tell you, are generally, you, you parts per million. So it's like I said, this change in current, the fractional change in current, okay, with respect to something else, okay. Well, you can do with respect to temperature as well. Temperature is, a, if you're doing a real design, we won't do too much of that in this class. But, except right now we're going to do some, but <laughs> the, uh, what's the sensitivity of our circuits to temperature variations? MOS transistors, they degrade as you go up in temperature. You get a bit of 100 degrees C, they're not quite as fast, you know, K prime, mobility kind of goes down, so K prime sort of go down, goes down. V threshold changes a little bit. As you go down in temperature, V threshold changes more, okay. Um, K prime actually gets better, mobility gets better. People talk about running circuits down at, you know, cold temperatures, right? You know, 77 degrees Kelvin, or something like that, right? And liquid nitrogen. Little bit of a problem there. Where do you get the 77 degrees Kelvin? You know, it's kind of not such a real standard idea, but uh, things, so generally MOS gets better when you go lower. It gets worse as you go up in temperature. Well, quite often for commercial devices, okay, you got to work over some range. I, I can't, I'm not sure this is quite right. Minus 25 degrees C up to 100 degrees C sounds kind of right to me. Someone know Any, what the commercial? I mean, when you go out and sell something to Apple, you you design some new chips for their iPod. Okay, they're going to ask you to make sure it works over some reasonable range. So I guess this is for the people living up in Alaska, and this is for the people out in the desert somewhere, right? You know, <laughs> very hot desert. Yeah. What? Commercial grade chip, yeah, something like this. Line. Yeah, right. Yeah, not military. Not military, because you know, we send send our soldiers, you know, really weird places, right? So, we, <laughs> so it's got to go even more, more stranger temperatures. I've often wondered, though. I mean, if this thing's running at minus 70 degrees C or something like that, that person is not doing very well. He's probably not making a phone call, right? <laughs> he's, he's probably trying to figure out how to get warm. Right? <laughs> So, but anyway, that's, in fact, it may be up to like 70 degrees C, actually. 100 may be too high. I think it's like 25 to 70 degrees C. I think that's the commercial grade stuff. Still pretty hot. So the, um, besides your car gets pretty hot, though. You know, cars are actually pretty tough. They actually really demand uh, pretty tough uh, requirements. Because you think what happens in your car, you close that sucker up, you know, and it sun's out there, you open it up, that baby really gets, you want to turn your radio on, you want it to work right away, right? And so you've got a design for that. So cars are actually kind of nasty. Anyway, what do, we, what do we design for? How do we characterize robustness? Well, every circuit has a certain sensitivity to temperature. Well, this circuit we're going to talk about right now, just to give you an example of the kind of analysis you might do, you got to talk about this Fractional change, which is parts per million. So in other words, if you had a one milliamp current source, we're talking about parts per million would be 
uh, one nanoamp change. Okay, so number might be a hundred parts per million might be the number variation we're worried about per degree C. So if you have a hundred parts per million per degree C and the thing changes by you know, 70 degrees C from, let's say, normal, normally you design at 20 degrees C, room temperature. So you go up by 50 degrees to 70 degrees C, and you have 100 parts per million, that'd be 50 times 100 parts per million, so that would be 5,000 parts per million, or 5 times 10 to the minus 3 variation, and your initial, initial current was a microamp, you're going to have, you know, point five percent variation on that microamp. Okay. It's not too big. But you can see how it gets to be a problem if you make that number gets too large. If it was a thousand parts per million, then you start getting in trouble. Okay. So it's I delta I over I, the fractional change over the the change. Could have been supply now we're doing temperature. Let's look at this equation right here. Take I out V E B over R, that's what the output current was going to be. D I out D T, so I'm calculating this part of this expression works out to be 1 over R. And we take the dependence of both terms. There's a dependence on R and there's a dependence on VEB. 1 over R times VEB dt minus VEB over R squared dr dt. So we're looking at the R dependence of temperature, resistance dependence, and this, and this VEB value dependence. The, take, divide this by 1 over I out, which is VEB over R, and you end up with this as your equation. The temperature coefficient, parts per million per degree C, is 1 over VEB times DVEB dt minus 1 over R times dr dt. Okay? So it's actually, you can see what this is. This is sort of the parts per million of the R. All right. Um, that's all I did? That's all I did. Okay, so I'll let's just talk about this morning. Okay. Well, this dependence right here is fairly complicated. It's, I say, it's down to the physics of the device, and it's actually a kind of, there's a sort of a number for it, which I don't remember right this minute, right? It's like, you know, plus, should I give it over? Guessing, totally. <laughs> it's like 30 parts per million, and it's got a, a, a sign, plus or minus, which I also don't remember. But it's some sort of number like that. Okay, I won't write it down, so you won't <laughs> call me on this. But there's some value for this from the p physics of the device, and it has a certain, in other words, that value goes up with temperature. You can see the resistor comes in in a different way because it's in the denominator, it comes down. So the question is, what is the, the temperature dependence of the resistor? It can be plus or minus. You can see these two things can sort of cancel each other out. In fact, people do worry about that. Since this is kind of a function of the, of the process and the device itself, you can choose the material for your resistance in some, in some cases, if you're really sensitive, if you really worry about this, to be so it comp compensates for this temperature dependence over here. And that kind of thing sort of happens. So you can sort of get a net temperature coefficient that's very low, quite small, very compensated. And some very precise stuff, like these A to D converters and some things like that where people are trying very pre uh, instrumentation amplifiers, um, which are just very precise amplifiers, which need to vary something to a very high accuracy. You need to, you know, for whatever reason, you know, some instrumentation equipment. Uh, you might do this kind of design where you compensate for these temperature coefficients, and so you can get rid of a net one that's essentially zero. We won't do much more of that. That's kind of more stuff that's done in 240. Uh, but you can see it's pretty straightforward. You've got to know what these dependencies are. You figure out what the circuit is, and you can sort of see what your dependence becomes. Right? What's the, for this circuit, what is the sensitivity to supply, right? 1 over I out, D, V, no, D, I out, D, V, D, D. Well, far as this equation is concerned, it's zero, right? So we have a zero sensitivity for this one, so it's very robust. In actual fact, there probably still is some sensitivity because VEB is probably a function of current, and there's probably some current variation still coming in in a second order or third order effect, right? And so, so don't you still have to worry about that on very precise circuits. We're going to do some more of these, but we'll take a break. Three minutes. Where are you?
microphone's broken. I yeah, they're broken over here, too. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm yeah. Sorry. yeah, they're broken here, too. We should tell them. I yeah. had a couple of questions. First was the first thing when you talked about hand calculations. I have hand calculations over five pages and stuff. Which one do you need? Like, what do you Get it down to... A smaller I mean, amount. That's what I did when I was do my, doing my hand cutting before I, when I was designing the circuit. Like, so what you Sum do? it down to the to the essence. Okay, I mean. Like yeah. what we finally came up with. Finally came up with you. Finally, you finally. Okay. Also, you talked about zero operating point for all circuits. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, zero operating point uh, for when the circuit you just had. Does it happen for all circuits? Because I think when I tried to bias with instead of a resistor, I put like a bunch of. Um, Transistors for my for the thing. I think Spice also found a zero operating point. Maybe so there, would there be a starter problem for anything? It's only in that particular circuit that you'd have a zero operating point. Yeah, it's because of these. It's because of this. It's kind of a feedback thing, right? No, but something that's just a string that should not have a zero problem. Okay. Okay. You might have had too many transistors. Too many transistors. Okay. If you have two, if you have the sum of the VTs is greater than the supply oh, you can't right, turn yeah, on okay that's, that's probably what it was um and also can you show the how you just did that supply thing really fast i didn't really follow the one with the resistor first one how you all that like you this somehow, somehow yeah you canceled like so what's this curve right here this curve is I -R -R -I -L, okay so i'm driving this look at this bottom half i'm driving this side with il and I'm looking at what IR is. Okay. So what's happening here is as we increase this side, then we start to get some VGS developed here. Okay. Finally, what happens? This guy goes into saturation. Once he goes into saturation, this voltage becomes VT plus VD sat. Right. Okay. That's applied to this R. And that flattens out then. This so this flat this this the current on on the IR will become equal to VT plus VD sat divided by R. Okay. Then I said let's make VD sat really small compared to VT. And so they end up with this curve right here where this says this is just VT. Why is R. that? But when there's saturation, why is that always VD, VT plus VD sat? Like with that? Oh, okay. <laughs> you gonna ask me that? No, no, no. <laughs> take that back. Take that back. <laughs> oh, that last one is mm -hmm. when we're doing our FOM. Um, we like. Oh, I'm sorry. When we were doing a test bench, right? It said we passed all the tests. It said our FOM was point almost thirty milli volts. Is that really small? Not milli. Milli. Is that really small? I really don't know. I don't know. 30... You want to minimize that flow, first of all. How much current you have flowing through your circuit? It's very small, like For the alpha stage? Uh, no, not for the alpha stage. Alpha stage has to be going like 6. Yeah, so, so you're probably dominated by that for your current, for your out, for your current. Okay, so figure that out. Then figure out your area. You have any really big transistors? Yeah, for that alpha stage. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you can sort of see what it probably has to be, right? I mean, you can, if it's dominated by that one circuit, then then that's probably a pretty reasonable solution. If you want to, for A become a mode, you have to, I have to increase the L, to increase the R O, and increasing this, and then there's a mismatch between uh, matching the current between this. Uh, this Change and this. So and this this time is going to uh, multiply with the uh, current coefficient. And for that there's a mismatch between this current. And if we wanna if we don't wanna change the L of this transistor. And so there's a mismatch to raise the uh, the this voltage is going to drop to three hundred millivolts. Uh, and for that, I use the, the offset. Then it's in okay. But if I want don't if I don't want to use the offset, I have to increase the L as this to make them the same. So I have to multiply by three. So then my F1 increased by a factor of three. It's before it was 0.3, and now it's about 1.5. Uh, which I should, which, are, which strategy I should choose? Use uh, offset. The offset, okay, because the offset is not a good uh, strategy for in reality. Don't yeah, it is. Use, uh, no, it is. No, no, you do. No, uh, that's fine. No, it, uh, it's okay. What, 
all it says is that a user, you know, has to know that if he puts zero volts here, the output is going to be offset. And if he wants it exactly zero volts, he's going to have to tweak a little bit. But, but that's okay. I mean, there's all sorts of process variation anyway. You know, it's not going to always exactly be zero. Uh, but so, uh, I should I make the same? And there's another problem. Uh, for uh, I just for increasing the gain of this um, stage, gain stage, I decrease the VD side of this side and this side to a little bit go to the uh, subtraction. Mm -hmm. So and then uh, I expect to increase. So the GM I should say expect to be at uh, this region is not is less is less than what I uh, expect to be by the equation you said to ID set over K for WL. Yeah. It's less than that. So I didn't, for example, I expect to get again 100, 180, but I get again about 100. Is it okay? Yeah, if you just understand what's going on, and yeah. it's come the transistor, you say, I, uh, the transistor model actually because of... And the other right. point is, when I increase the current, the, the, the VIC current voltage, to, to, the, uh, to the minimum range, to point five, then the, my AV current voltage became, became very, very little. I don't understand why. It's just in, in the so border going of this saturation. It's going to be just in the border of the border of the linear region. Yeah, that's and, and the border. What's what's going to have? What's happening then? Well, this, this may be maybe more than the border. It may be you're going in the linear region here, right? No, but it's still in saturation. Well, if this current shouldn't change. If this is in saturation, these two currents, that current will stay equal to this current. Uh -huh. So if it's not doing that, it's probably not in saturation anymore. No. Uh, the Spice as it is. The output of the sim simulation says that it, it is still in some saturation. Maybe, maybe it's wrong in some way. The output of some yeah. yeah it is. I, I, I think when it's get down to subthreshold, uh, yeah. the that that those names it's are a little bit off. Change. It says cut off when it's yeah. really not cut off. Yeah. 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 Well, last yeah. question is if it passes the test bench, does it pass all the specs? Because yes. Oh, okay, so I don't have to do the output swing over the input swing. Right? No. Oh, it's two separate. Right? Test bench to test bench. Right. Okay, thank you. Oh, I just want to um, remind you that... Um, Talk to you after class? Yeah. Oh, so you remember. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, someone just asked me um, about, do you have to create some new test benches, okay? Uh, effectively, I mean, if you pass the test benches which we gave you, that's all the test benches you need to pass. You don't need to worry about worst case variation of input common mode voltage with output swing at the same time. Just individual, the two tests are individual, okay? So, don't use the test benches. That, that's, that's the specs that you have to meet. That don't, life's probably tough enough with that. <laughs> don't need to make it worse. Okay, how about some more of these? I'll do a couple more, another one of them. Um, here it is, same old top half, just like before. Here's a new bottom half. So this bottom half, what we're going to do is a diode-connected bipolar transistor here, resistor, and this guy right here. Now, what's this multiple emitter thing? What this multiple emitter thing is, it's kind of like increasing the W over L of a bipolar, of an MOS transistor. What you do in a bipolar is if you make the emitter area larger, it's like making the W over L bigger, okay? IS, the saturation current in a bipolar transistor, is proportional to the emitter area of the emitter, okay? Just like I said for MOS, the subthreshold is proportional to W over L, so it's sort of the same sort of thing. Now, making the area of the emitter larger, if you have a unit size emitter, let's say Q1, that's that emitter, if we make this one N times bigger, so this is N times A emitter for this guy versus this area of the emitter is this nominal value for this Q1, okay? This one's n times bigger. Then IS will be n times bigger. IS of 1 of 2 will be equal to n times the IS of transistor 1. Remember that formula? IS, I EB for this case is equal to IS times E to the VEB over VT thermal. Okay, now 
let's go around this curve. So we have a VEB here. We have a VGS here up, a VGS down. Let's assume these two devices are the same, so these two cancel out. So we go up and come down. So this VEB here is dropped across. So this is at that same VEB of 1. Is dropped across this resistor and VEB of 2. So that's what I have here. I out times R. So this is I out. Well, in this current, this current equals this current. So this is I out here as well. So I out times R plus VEB of 2 which is the voltage drop across here, is equal to VEB of 1. Okay. Now, if I take this equation here and invert it and solve for VEB, I get V thermal times natural log of I out over N times IS1. So this is VEB of 2. And this is VEB of 1. This is formula right here. Now what I can do is I can ratio these two things. Bring everything on the same side. The I outs cancel. The V thermals cancel. No, no, no cancel, I guess. They just come outside up front. But anyway, I bring this all together, and I end up with this equation right here. I out equals V thermal over R times the natural log of the ratio of the area of this emitter to the area of this emitter. So this is kind of nice. We've kind of now got rid of a lot more dependencies. Right? We're now a function of ratios, and function of ratios is always usually good in terms of getting things more accurate. Okay? Still got a direct dependence on R. Yeah, it's tough there. And V thermal. I guess you mentioned earlier about sometimes taking R off chip, and that actually does happen sometimes. Or sometimes some people will just because you can get a precise value for it, or you can have a final tweak. There's something else you might want to do. Okay, so we end up with this equation right here. So again, this formula, same old deal. This gives you a plot, looks like this. The in answer comes out to be V thermal over R times natural log of N. Here's an interesting one for you. What's the temperature dependence of this? What is V thermal equal to? KT, right? So if I take the derivative of this, what am I going to get for the temperature dependence? D I out D temperature, you know, for that ratio that we need to calculate, it's, it's equal to unity, right? This thing has unity dependence on the temperature. So why? So then times one over I out if you want to get the sensitivity. This is a, often what we end up needing to do in order for this compensation stuff I just talked about earlier, right? This thing has a, a increasing dependence on temperature, linearly proportional to temperature, okay? So this is I out versus temperature, you know, it's, there's a slope to this, which is, you know, depending on the transistor parameters and stuff, but it goes up. Often what we can do is, like I talked about before, we can use that to compensate something else that's going down. Okay. In fact, some of this voltage-dependent stuff I talked, this voltage reference things I was mentioning earlier, they often use a proportional to absolute temperature current source. Okay. And sometimes you have a voltage that actually is proportional to absolute temperature as well. They call them PTAT sources, proportional to absolute temperature. So this compensation thing about compensating one with another. This actually was a lot more useful in bipolar. Uh, this, uh, you look in some of the old books and stuff like that, and a lot of the real precision circuits that are in bipolar, they do a lot of this compensation stuff. It turns out, I think, bipolar, because a lot of the parameters were more a function of the basic device physics, that you could do these kind of tricks. It's not so true at MOS. So MOS is kind of varying all over the map, you know. And so these kinds of compensation things, especially in the more advanced processes, are getting so you. It's 
there's so much variation going on. You just got to design to be independent of all kinds of variation and not try to do compensation techniques. But that being said, these techniques are used in really precision stuff and really clever. I mean, boy, I mean, there, there are circuits, even MOS ones, where people have worked on compensating the third and fourth order effects. I mean, you have this going up, and this has got a quadratic, and this has got a cubic, so you have a compensating quadratic and a compensating cubic, and, you know, and a lot of fun, okay, to figure all this stuff out, right? But um, it's kind of not so useful anymore just because of the variation in the transistors these days. Right. Okay, yes? Yeah, yeah, R shading too. Yeah, we haven't got rid of that here. You know, we still got an R dependence here. I was not including the dependence of R, right? Yeah, yeah. That proportional R presumably has a much lower dependence, right? Right. So if it's heavily doped, R is not. Small values of R can be done with heavily doped transistor resistors, and they're not so temperature dependent. Is sometimes you can use. Silic polysilicon that's not doped, okay, undoped polysilicon for really large resistors. You get really small area, but then the, the value is 30% variation and it's got a large temperature dependence. So can you live with that? So it's, it's kind of an area versus, you know, performance value. If, you know, it's, you can get the transistors that are one ohm per square, probably very little temperature dependence, but then you have to have a huge transistor if you want to try to do something a very large resistance value. So there's usually, usually a trade-off between large value resistors is less accuracy and more temperature dependence. Low value resistors are lower temperature dependence, more accuracy, but usually um, more area, which is cost. Okay. Cascode self by a source. Okay, so what happens if we want to do a little improvement on our current source? You know, make it a better one. We can use the same circuit that we had before, okay, and we can make it, we can cascode it, just like we did before, and then we can bias out, use those bi the bias transistors here to give ourselves a current source which is actually much better in terms of its output current value, right? Of course, the same old problem as usual here, this now has a swing problem, right? You know, this only can go up so far, right? For this is not a high swing case, I could make this a high swing circuit so that I bias this point at a VD sat below VDD, then this circuit could have a high swing characteristics and it could go all the way up to two VD sat, you know, VDD minus two VD sat if you wanted to. So that's just normal old stuff we talked about before. The other thing about this which is not so obvious, if you sort of do the second order effects on what happens down here, okay, I mean there is some voltage dependence down here, which we kind of threw out in our analysis there. At VEB, we sort of said it was kind of constant, okay? Well, it's actually not. It is a function of temperature. It's got an exponential. It doesn't change very much, but it does change. Cascoding this actually makes this a better current source. It makes it more supply independent than what we had before. So if you really want a really, truly supply independent source, you can begin to cascode like this, and that'll actually help the supply independence as well. So it helps the output resistance and the supply independence. Okay? Come question about that? Okay, well, that's all I'm going to say. I mean, current sources are used everywhere. We've been using them like crazy, and uh, we talked about this before. You can use any current source up here you want. You can cascode it. You can make it supply independent. You can do, if you make, of course, if you cascode up here, you should cascode down the bottom. You know, and if you do that, then you end up with a circuit that looks like this. So this goes to a bias that you need to derive from somewhere to bias this bottom cascode. There's an upper cascode. So these are bias V bias 1, V bias 2, V bias 3. So you've got to establish these somewhere. I mean, you can do it by something like this or whatever way you want to do it. So here's our V in, and here's our V out. What kind of gain does this circuit have? What's it going to be? Well, it's going to be minus GM, because big GM equals little GM for this circuit, right? 
If I ground this, put a voltage here, how much current do I get into that ground? It's just GM of this transistor. The current here equals the current here, so a cascode does nothing to G sub M. Right? So, so this circuit also has big G sub M equal to minus little G sub M, just like before. What's the output resistance of this guy? Looking into here, we see a GM R naught squared up. We see a GM R naught squared down. So I got a GM P R naught squared P in parallel with a GM N R naught N squared. So this guy has a gain of minus GM roughly. Let's say GM N equals GMP and R naught zero is R naught P, which is not usually true, but let's do that. R naught squared. Wow. So in one stage, you got the gain of like two stages, right? Call this a telescopic op amp. Why is that? Because it looks like a telescope, right? You look in here and stuff comes out up there, right? Okay. What's the problem with this circuit? Swing. I hear swing. Exactly right. I mean, this thing's got big swing problems, right? You can make, this goes up to 2 VD sat, which is not too bad, actually, right? But you got problems down here. So you can, if you can do these high swing biasing here, you can help yourself out a bit. Okay. It's not differential with a problem, right? Okay, so I guess that's it on that. Um, Current sources, that's it. So any questions about current sources or any issues about those you'd like to talk about? Yes? Can you actually go over the lead thermal stuff by stage again? The V thermal self bias stage. V thermal. The bio the transistor down there, I mean? V thermal. Oh, the first one. No, V thermal. Oh, this. 33. Yeah, I, I think the key here is this upper part right here is just the same as we've always, right? So it's this bottom you have to look at, right? So the question is let's just go around, let's do the case VL around this loop right here. And what is it equal to? KVL is equal to V EB of transistor 1. That's right here. And let's call this transistor 2. Let's call it transistor 3. And transistor 4. Plus VGS of transistor 3 minus VGS of transistor 4. I go up and I come back down again. To VGS of this transistor. Plus or minus, right? I out, because this current here equals that current, I out, or I left, I mean, I left equals I, or I right equals I out, right? So I right equals I left equals I out. All these transistors assume the same. Times R minus V B E V E B of transistor 2 equals 0. So I just went around this loop. Assume VGS3 equals VGS4. These two cancel. VEB is equal to V thermal times the natural log of I out over IS of that transistor. Okay? So if I plug in for this, I get V thermal times the natural log of I out over IS1 minus V thermal times natural log of I out over IS2. Okay? And I say, and I'll take this to the other side here, equals I out times R. Well, this thing here, I can just rewrite as V thermal times the natural log of IS2 over IS1, right? Because I outs cancel and bring them inside the log. 
equals I out times R. IS2, I said, was equal to N times IS1 by making the areas of the emitters N times bigger. So this becomes equal to N. So I out equals V thermal over R times natural log of N. And N is some number like 5 or something like that, 10. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Outputs. Not going to do a lot of output. Okay, so um, let me get. Okay, so we talked a little bit already about this circuit right here. Basically, it's a common source follower. The difference is we got this output return to ground. That's pretty typical. Output stages are returned to midpoint of the supply, right? Because you want to swing in positive and negative directions, typically. Okay? You can either split the supply, or you can say you have zero to a supply and have half between the supply, like you did in your project. Same thing. Okay. So now, the question here, as you know, you have to have this IQ equal, that's what sets the negative excursion of this thing. Most negative you can go is minus IQ times RL, and that's equal to VD or VD sat, whichever is greater than going negative. Okay? And I talked about that before. Now, that's the problem with this circuit is you always have this current flowing. This is called a class A circuit. Class A means you always have bias current flowing. You're always in sort of the linear region of operation. There's class B, there's class C, there's class E, there's class F, okay? There's lots of other classes, okay? And some of them are kind of, it's not like a continuum of things either. Class F or class E is like a pulse position, you know, kind of thing. So there's a bunch of other, or pulse width modulation. So there's a bunch of other stuff going on. But let's look, we're going to go towards a class B circuit, okay? Now what's a class B circuit? Class B circuit does not have a current flowing when there's zero current input. Let's take that, or, okay? So this is I did this business of I worked that out for you. It's in my notes, so I'll do that again. Okay, if we added up, I should say, this is for that source follower we just talked about. If we look at the current flowing through this transistor, Okay, so what's the current flowing to this thing? You got IQ is coming from ground, so I mean it's IQ, it's the current on times the supply voltage, right? The current goes into the supply, it's minus that. If it's coming out of the supply, it's plus. So IQ times zero, that's a supply zero. This is IQ going into here. It's IQ going into minus VDD, so the power there is minus IQ, because it's going in, times minus VDD. You know, that's times each other. Plus, this is for the DC condition. Current coming out of here, this is IQ, this will be IQ, and this will be IQ. So we have plus an IQ times VDD for this M1 transistor. And going down here, we'll have a minus IQ times a minus VDD again for the current going through this transistor. There's zero, this is assumed to be zero volts, there's zero current going through there. So we end up with a total power of three times IQ times VDD for this circuit. That's, that's when there's zero volts coming out. We always have this amount of current flowing. That's a lot, okay, so now, that's a lot of current. What's the most current we can have, what's the most power we can have into our load? The most power we can have into our load, if we sort of ignore the fact that you can't go all, you have to be a VD sat at least below IDD, and let's assume the same thing. We set IQ so we're within a, we got all the way down to a VD sat from there. And let's assume VD sat small compared to VDD because we're going to see the bigger swing we have, the more efficiency we have. So the maximum swing we can get out of this thing is actually going to be the peak value, V peak, you know, right here is going to be VDD over 2. 
Okay. VRMS is equal to VDD, I mean V peak, divided by root 2. Okay? So if we take the power into the load, it's going to be is equal to power into the load is equal to VRMS squared over the load resistance. Okay? What's that? Best case is going to be is going to be equal to power into load is going to be when we place this by VRMS squared is V peak over root two, so it's V peak squared over two RL and V peak is equal to VDD over two, so we have VDD squared over two, which is four times two is eight times RL. So this the peak value you're going to have is VDD squared over 8 RL. The output, the total power we have consumed is um, whoops, uh, I gotta get from IQ. IQ IQ is equal to VDD over VDD over 2 over RL, right? So we have 3 times, because that's the current we have to set for IQ to have the maximum swing, 3 times VDD over 2 over RL times VDD. OK, VDDs cancel, RLs cancel, and we end up with 1 over 8 times 6, 1 <laughs> This is like a 2% efficiency. Now, part of the reason that's so low is because I included all the current through this bias string. Often you don't do that. You don't need to have the bias current there equal to this current. We could ratio those current. So I could have gotten rid of that. But what you can get up to for this kind of circuit, the best case you can get ends up to be about um, uh, actually seems a little bit small. If you do everything right, you can get about 25 percent. Maybe I'll do that next time. This is pretty low efficiency. If I have a hundred watt, I want to drive a hundred watts into a speaker. I have 25 percent efficiency. It means 400 watts being dissipated inside my circuit. This is not good. How do we do better? I'll show you that next time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.